Welcome back everyone and it's time to go BALLS D! We all know by now that Black Clover Chapter 311 dropped a bombshell that Lucius Socrates and Astaroth the Time Devil are within Julius the Wizard King. This plot twist recontextualized the entire manga of Black Clover. But to save you time rereading the entire thing, because let's be honest, you guys are lazy, you don't want to do that shit. Plus, you know, you know, I'm subscribed to ABD. He's just gonna read that shit for me. Yeah, well, I did. We've done that for you. Yay! I want to die. In return, please smash the like button. The last video, you guys. Killed it! 30,000 likes was just way too easy. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna hit 50,000 soon. So let's try that again. We have found every foreshadowing and sign that Julius Novocrono was being manipulated by Lucius and Astaroth for their master plan. But before it can make any sense, I have to get all of you on the same page. Those of you that have the notification bell on for the channel probably already are because you watched our last video discussing the clock that Asta was sitting on. This current video will make less sense if you don't understand how Black Clover has changed forever because chapter 331 changed everything. So I highly recommend that you watch it. And remember, like and subscribe. <laughs> or else. Anyway, the clock tower starts ticking again in chapter 331, implying that time was manipulated the entire previous arc. Lucius had been manipulating the timeline of certain events. Let's begin from the start. What are the events? Let's begin with the most obvious. Julius remembers a scene in chapter 331 where he felt immense uneasiness. For example, this means a foreshadowing was placed in chapter 281. The ancient demon attacked the Clover Kingdom and there was no one that could save them until Julius Novocronus stepped in. He advised advanced his body's age by 10 years, making himself 23 years old again. He states, both my time and abilities are limited, but if I combine my power with Damnatios, he would be able to defeat the devil. As he is about to use chronostasis on the demon god, his transformation immediately gets undone and his time is up. Julius is shocked himself. He doesn't understand how can this happen as he states, I'm out of time already? Why? It's it's too soon. We have the answer to his question. It's because of Lucius Socrates and Astaroth using his stored time magic and making it run out for their own plan. But of course, Julius is not aware of that. In chapter 143, we were told time magic allows the user to steal and store time from others. And then they use that time to accelerate, decelerate, stop, or even reverse the flow of time. This means the amount of time stored is limited and we confirmed through the clock in the spade nation that time was indeed being manipulated the entire fight against lucifero and the other devils on top of that this connects with our other factor regarding julius's grimoire always being open as it is coverless which means lucius and astaroth would have access to using its power at all time to prove this even further take a look at chapter 143 julius states time magic has a coverless grimoire i didn't know whether i was good or bad but i was special and so i thought a lot about what i might be and what I should do. Julius in his inner monologues states that he walks his own path and he became the wizard king out of his own choice. But throughout chapter 143, he states who'd have thought he had two souls in one body. So it was you, but at the same time, it wasn't you. Ironically, this is the case with himself. But to make things clear, Julius is not evil. Chapter 143 makes it way too obvious that this cannot be the case. All his inner monologues are in regard to saving the human race rather than going against it. Even in chapter 331, he tries to get himself restrained before anything bad can happen. Tabata wrote it in this way because if he made Julius the evil one, then it would have retconned and destroyed the past chapters. So instead, he is going to create a reason why Julius cannot remember that he has Lucius and Astaroth within himself. We 
we will definitely make a future video dissecting this part of the story. So again, get this video to 30,000 likes and I'll make sure it gets done. So essentially, the grimoire was always open. That's why it was coverless, which means Lucius and Arthur of the Time Devil always had access to his grimoire to use the time magic that was stored by him for their own plan. Now, another sign that foreshadowed his true identity was his knowledge of the Weg curse. Julius was the one who explained to Asta what the Weg curse was and that it was a sign that a mage had been drawing on forbidden magic from a world beyond their own when nobody else had this information. The only families that would have known this type of information would be the ones that had ties to devils like Narked Falstice family members or if you were a host of a supreme devil yourself. Now due to Julius's subconscious connections to Astaroth and the fact that he'd been drawing upon his magic all along, he knew about the real location of devils and how the way curse worked. So as we've mentioned, Julius knew about Weg magic. The rest of the magic knights and royals had no idea what it was. Actually, you know what? They didn't even know devils existed. The elves knew because they were ancient from 500 years ago and had more knowledge, but humans fell into ignorance and they did not study. When we look at Noel, she said she only heard about devil stories from their nanny as a folklore. So people didn't even really know if they existed. But but Weg magic isn't the only thing Julius knew above everybody else. He also knows how to read grimoire text. Something as ancient as that shouldn't be possible unless he has extensive knowledge. Normally spells are written in scripts that are coherent to the mage. Spells may be written in different languages. Look at chapter 20. If they draw magic from alternative sources like devils and spirits, it has different writing. Additionally, ultimate magic that draws power from natural mana results in pages filled with runes. Now when we look at chapter 21, Julius reads Aster's anti-magic book and he's shocked at what it is, having an indication and idea to himself on what it is about. And then he pretends that he doesn't understand the devil writing within it. But he immediately knows that it was anti-magic and the function of it. He also does this with Yuno, reading his book with the wind spirit and could explain explain it to him what it meant. This was a huge hint that Julius knows about the way curse from the very beginning and can read devil spells, meaning that Lucius and Osteroth's manipulation was working at this moment. Julius then holds the anti-magic sword. He smirks to himself in a very sinister manner and then tells Aster he has no mana without Aster having to tell Julius. Aster asks him, how does he know? When he replies stating, that's a very good question. Let's answer that question using Lucius and Asteroth. From Black Clover's past, we know Aster's mother died 16 years ago. Lysita had found Lich's five-leaf grimoire, which was near Harj village. Remember, that is where the ancient skeleton of the ancient demon god resides and she was outcasted to live in isolation, being a lower class citizen and due to her unique life force absorption magic. After Lysita's death, within the Five Leaf Grimoire, Liba had been stuck in there by her for safety and to avoid Lucifero. But in those years, Liba had unlocked anti-magic, changing the book's magic completely. But since we know for a fact that Liba was stuck in the book for 15 years and no one could claim the book due to its anti-magic properties, he would have to wait for Aster to grow up until he was 15 to claim it and then the grimoire could attach itself to his soul as grimoire are predestined to those it has chosen. Lucius and Astaroth would have known the location of the book through planning the betrayal of Lucifero, wanting to claim his devil heart for his plan. Therefore, he would have found out about Lucifero's attempt to leave the underworld by using Liber. That would then give him the location of a five-leaf grimoire and we know for a 
of fact, Julius was curious. Julius admitted that in his curiosity, he found the swallow tail, the first wizard king's device from 500 years ago. That gave him a rune on his head that revived him, so the plot threads have already been set in place. So now, when you read chapter 1 again, it's been recontextualized. You will see that the five leaf grimoire that Lieber was stuck in, it's actually inside a wall in Hodge village, near the location it would have been when Lacida died. Why would such a unique grimoire be placed there if it wasn't by someone? How did it get into the wall? And why would someone hide it from Nero as Nero had claimed she watched over the grimoire for 500 years as best as she possibly could? This means Lucius wanted to know what magic the grimoire contained, nor was it claimed. So this would then explain chapter 1. Lucius and Osteroth waited to find out who would claim that grimoire. And then when they found out Aster had obtained it, read its book, and it was anti-magic, he smirked and immediately knew the truth behind it all. This can also be hinted in chapter 146, when Julius plans to build a new future. He thinks of Aster because he has good intentions and wants to change the classism and the society for the better. But now, this also implies for Lucius, as he used Aster's magic for his own plan. When we look into this even further, the whole dungeon incident already had a suspicious start, where Julius is the one who specifically sends both Asta and Yuno to investigate this newly appeared dungeon bordering the Diamond Kingdom. In the dungeon, both Asta and Yuno find convenient tools for their powers just laying dormant inside the dungeon. This whole thing is almost inverse of what happened to Xenon. One thing Tabata loves is to use duality and checkered patterns for Asta and Yuno. Like how in the recent chapter, Asta speaks about his mother's death, but Yuno gets to meet his living mother. We mentioned the importance of this for the story in our review of chapter 431, so check it out if you haven't. But the main takeaway from this is that Xenon and Alan are the counterparts of Yuno and Aster. So the dungeon incident ended with Xenon killing his best friend, and the devil inside the dungeon, who was planted by none other than Lucius himself, considering his connections to the devils. Invert that, and you get Aster and Yuno going to the dungeon and instead finding something that will make them walk the wrong path forever. They find convenient tools specifically catered to their powers. Another strange fact to prove that the sword was moved is that 500 years ago Licht still had the Demon Dweller sword. So how the hell did it end up in a dungeon during that time? That don't make no sense! The only explanation that exists is the fact that it was moved there by someone during that time. Even if it was somehow moved by coincidence to the dungeon, it was already tainted with anti-magic somehow, and it was put in the same dungeon as Belle. And then when you break it down even further, when Yuno first interacted with Belle, time had stopped. You don't find that suspicious. And Yuno and Belle could still interact with each other, but everyone else was stopped. How? It was Lucius. Oh yeah. It's all coming together. Now at this point of the video, I want to shout everyone on Twitter that helped us make this video by the way. You, you, yes you, and you. They helped us find another sign during the Royal Knights arc. Julius brings the idea up of a unconscious betrayal. However, during that arc, it was hinted at being Langris, which was true by the way. But now we know that unconscious betrayal was a gut feeling presented by himself, as he realized during chapter 331 that he is the devil that saved the nation and has been using time magic from Osteroth. That's why his intuition was so sharp as Marx puts it. And also, by the way, we saw that a lot of people are claiming that Gordon's dad foreshadowed Julius that he had the time devil all along and that there was a giant flame in the royal capital. However, this is not the case. This is not true. It's false. No way. Not a chance. You're wrong. 
The spell that Gordon's father casted was to highlight curses on a map, not devils, meaning the curse that the map picked up on was actually Charlotte and not Osteroth. But this is also part of Lucius' plan because he wanted everyone to believe that Medjucula was a queen and a supreme devil that could replace Osteroth's rank in hell. So at the end of the day, Lucius made all of this into fruition, placing Medjucula's curse everywhere, making all this shit happen. Now I'm going to pass the video on to Harrison as he's going to cover all the other signs. There's 10 more signs and foreshadowings starting from chapter 22. Now if we take a look at chapter 22, Aster meets Julius following their dungeon mission. As Julius holds on to Aster's newly acquired second sword, he realizes it absorbs his magic and smirks menacingly. Julius tells Aster about how he can wield it because he has no magic, to which Aster responds with, how do you know I have no magic? Julius tries to play it off by saying that that is a very interesting question. And so it is, but with the reveal of chapter 331, it recontextualizes their entire meeting. He knew Aster had no magic as he could see, so thanks to the time magic letting him see the future. And the smirk on his face after holding the anti-magic sword is because Lucius finally realized that an ability existed to defeat Lucifer for good. I mean, just look at this panel from his fight against Patrick. It is stated that Julius can read the flow of mana from the future. And so when he came into contact with Aster, he saw the future of Lucifer's demise, which is one of the pieces of the puzzles to Lucius's grand plan and why he has taken such a liking to Aster specifically. Astaroth is one of the kings of hell and we know this magic in combination with the host is extremely amplified and powerful. Astaroth has completely disappeared from hell, meaning that 100% of his body is within the real world. Therefore, Lucius's future sight ability reading the manor in the surrounding area must be much, much greater. Oh, and uh, whilst we're on the topic of menacing smirks, just look at this panel of Julius. It is literally the very first thing we see of him in the entire story. Just, just look at that man. The seeds were there all along. However, one of the biggest foreshadows that Lucius had his finger in all the pies and even more specifically was focused on Aster a great deal as he needs him for his master plan are the events of chapter 35 and 36. In chapter 35, Julius was already waiting at the Eye of the Midnight Sun hideout to save Aster. He says how he and Aster seem to be linked by fate, but Come on, we all know that's no longer the case. Julius had gone to the hideout early and was waiting for them to bring Aster to him as he saw the future and knew that they would go there and thus he wanted to save Aster. But what's even crazier is in the following chapter, chapter 36. This chapter is called Light and Lucius is Latin for light. Who's on the front cover? Julius in a pose that looks like a clear homage to none other than Aizen. One of the most coveted and well-known villains in all of Shonen who had also planned out everything from the beginning just like Lucius. When Marx tries to contact him to tell him about the attack on the royal capital, Julius butts in and says how he knows that the capital was under attack and that the enemy was repelled safely before Marx can even tell him. How else would he have known that if not for the fact that he saw it in the future? He knew the attack wouldn't be a problem and he knew it would happen, which is why he preemptively turned up at the Eye of the Midnight Sun base to intercept them. After all, in chapter 10, when he witnesses Aster's anti-magic, he says how there's an abnormal situation on our hands. Am I right? Don't worry, I found somebody very interesting. He isn't talking to Marx in this panel, as Marx straight up has no clue what the hell he's even talking about. Okay, now if we think back to the first time we see Julius, you may remember something a little bit peculiar. Julius was first seen using transformation magic, and really that's where the red flags began to occur. You see, it is stated in the world of Black Clover that only a select few are capable of having a two types of magic. They are hybrids, which we knew wasn't the case with Julius. Patrick confirmed this during their fight when he said that Julius is just a human. The other instance of dual magic types is someone like Mars, but 
That is the result of illegal magic experiments achieved only by Morris. And even though the Dark Triad and Morris have been acquainted, that only seems to be after the event with Mars and the Witch Queen, and plus we can just see from Lucius's grimoire that it's not artificially created. And so that could have only ever left us with Devil Host. Dante, Zenon and Vanica, along with Morris too, all displayed the magic attributes of themselves and their respective devil too. And what do you know? The same was going for Julius this entire time. He had his transformation magic, or whatever it really ends up being revealed as, along with Astaroth's time abilities too. On the topic of his magic though, we know in the world of Black Clover that when a spell is active, the grimoire is open. That is just fact. Well, have you ever wondered why Julius's grimoire was just constantly open 24-7? It's because Lucius had a spell active the entire time hiding his true identity. And that is why it wasn't until this chapter in 331 that we finally saw it close because the spell had finally concluded. We all just thought that it was a coverless grimoire and it was special, but... Nope, it's just that as far back as Julius can remember, the grimoire was always in use, meaning Julius never saw the cover of it. After all, he does state against Pantry that he has had time magic for as long as he can remember, meaning that from the very moment he laid eyes on his grimoire, Lucius and Astroth's influence was already in effect. Now on the topic of Astroth's influence, if we look at chapter 216, we meet Damnatio for the very first time as he located the devil-possessed wrench using his scale magic. He perceives this to be Asta, however, there is one problem with that. His scales pick up devil magic, yet Lieber famously has none. That's how he was able to pass through the border of the underworld into the real world, and how he's able to wield anti-magic. So therefore, it shouldn't be possible for Damnatio's scales to detect Lieber, so if it wasn't Lieber his scales were picking up, it could have only ever been Astaroth. We also have Yami and William, who Julius became extremely close with, essentially making them who they are today by inviting them into the Magic Knights. Two people who just so happen to be essential to the Cliffoth ritual, as they both have dark magic and world tree magic. I mean, just look at this panel here from chapter 79 when William explains his meeting with Julius. He mentions how he wasn't interested in his appearance, only his magic. This seemed wholesome at the time, but now it's much more sinister knowing Lucius's intentions. This would also explain the Pantry vs Julius fight. Back then, people wondered in the community why Julius didn't kill Pantry. After all, he said he couldn't lose, right? And yes, I know there is the moral high ground answer of, well, Julius simply didn't want to kill Pantry because it was William's body too and he didn't want to kill his friend, blah blah blah. Well, that's the easy explanation. However, we now know that there was an ulterior motive behind sparing William's body, and that is the fact that Lucius needed the world tree magic of his to open the tree of Cliffhoff. He also happened to let William off the hook despite instigating, you know, a whole ass war against the Clover Kingdom by helping the elves. Whereas when you look at someone like Gwelder on the other hand, who was thrown into prison for his crimes, and is even alluded to the fact that Julius may have killed him if not for the others being around, as he specifically said that without them, he wouldn't have been able to tone down his magic. So if Gweldre was thrown into prison for betraying the kingdom, why was William of all people let off the hook if not for the fact that he was needed for Lucius's grand master plan? Hmm? And of course, we all have a laugh and a joke about Yami, right? He's the OG Isekai protagonist of Black Clover after all. However, who is to say that just like how Lucius got Julius to subconsciously get connected with William, he didn't do the same with Yami and manipulate the events to have him wind up in the Clover Kingdom. He is the only character with dark magic and if there is one thing that we know does not exist in the world of Black Clover anymore, it's coincidences. Julius took such an interest in Yami that once his dark magic manifested, he made him like a son. He taught him the Clover Kingdom language, how to read, write, everything. And who was the Magic Knight squad that accepted Yami and took him in? Julius's Grey Deer, who just so happened, by the way, to also have a member of the Faust family on board who have an extremely close familial connection to Devil 
binding contracts. Now, another sign that just blew my mind when I first heard of it, despite it actually making so much sense, and a huge shout out to QB on Twitter for showing this to us. And remember, if you want to feature in one of our videos, then just follow our Twitter as we constantly put out posts to interact with the community. Anyway, moving back to this piece of evidence, in chapter 296, Avanika goes after Asia, despite the fact that her resting place was supposed to be secluded. Avanika adds to this that she had just gotten possessed by Majicula and that she had heard that Asi was the strongest at the time. Somehow, Vanika had managed to find the exact location of a secluded royal's resting place. We all know that she has an IQ score about equal to the amount of fingers that she has, and so there's just no way she could have figured it out all on her own, and since we know that Lucius was the one that planted Majicula to be a pseudo-supreme queen of the underworld when it was actually supposed to be Astaroth, this tells us that he had planted information to the siblings to manipulate them further. And last but not least, in the anime's second opening, yeah, second, more specifically the original version of the opening because uh, it changed like, I don't know, four different times, there is a sequence showcasing all of the captains, which by the way, a really cool detail is the fact that it shows the captains in the order of how their squads are ranked, which there's also some other cool details like how Fregelion's picture starts spinning, foreshadowing him being singled out for the Patri attack. However, the strangest piece from this intro is the fact that some of the captains have black backgrounds, whereas the others have white ones. The ones with the black backgrounds are Gweldre, William, and finally, Julius. As we all know, Gweldre and William both ended up as traitors to the Clover Kingdom, and with chapter 331, you know where I'm going with this, it was revealed that Julius, or Lucius, was also a traitor all along. Now, before before someone dismisses this as a coincidence or that we're just reading too deeply into this, one, lighten up for fuck's sake, and two, this opening was directed by none other than the mad lad himself, Tatsuya Yoshihara, the director for the Black Clover anime throughout a majority of the series' runtime. Tatsuya Yoshihara is someone who has worked very closely with Tabata and even Shonen Jump as he illustrated a poster for Black Clover's sixth manga anniversary. And I think with that, that wraps up everything. We broke down every sign of Lucius and Astroth's existence in Black Clover, but we are not done yet. There are still three more videos that we need to create to explain what has to be described as one of the greatest plot twists in modern day manga. So make sure you watch this video if you haven't already and hit the notification bell for next time because oh boy, it's about to get spicy.